Okay, so the uh, last speaker of the session and of today, I think, is uh, Shin Gao from uh, Delphinus Lab. And uh, Shin is going to talk about ZK WASM, uh, a zero knowledge virtual machine that uh, supports uh, WebAssembly. Uh, thank you. Um, today I'm going to present uh, yet another uh, CK virtual machine that supports WebAssembly bytecode. It's not like CK EVM or Rig Zero because the bytecode it supports is uh, the pure WebAssembly. And the full work, uh, you can see all the circuit designs in this manuscript. And uh, the full virtual machine somehow open sourced in uh, the Deficiency Lab CK WASM repo. So you can download that and have a try and compile your C code or assembly script code and uh, have a try. And uh, you can try the sharding of the program and aggregating them and try to verify them on each other. So it's a, it's a full end-to-end -end, uh, solution that I open sourced about uh, two months ago. And uh, so the target uh, customers that we are targeting at the moment is some kind of existing projects that they do not have the expertise of leveraging the zero knowledge proofs technology, but they have the code that they want to actually use uh, the zero knowledge uh, to do some kind of trustless computation. Okay, so uh, it's pretty easy. You, you somehow edit your code, you do a compile, and uh, because currently uh, we do a static setup which makes the image and the code section and the module importing sections the, the fix um, a column of hollow two, so we need this compile image setup, and then you run the hollow image with the input that you have, and the prover will somehow prove it has uh, a witness of all the uh, transaction sequence, and uh, based on the enforcement of the transaction sequence, you can somehow make sure that the output that you have is a valid output. Okay, and this is the so I I, I cannot exaggerate it because. Uh, these are the unsupported instructions that we have. So basically you will find that everything that is float point related is not supported. And there's one thing that we do not support it is the indirect memory call and the memory grow because we have a fixed memory which uh, I will show you that is highly related to the benchmark. So, okay. so this is the um, circuit architecture that it's pretty straightforward. You have a WebAssembly image, right? When you run that, you, the, the prover somehow notice that there's an execution sequence, right? When we put the execution sequence into the execution circuit, we somehow enforce all the read write to somehow uh, get a valid result every time you read, and it's initialized, uh, initialized validly. Uh, and also, Every time you do a call, we enforce that you update the call frame circuit correctly uh, using our polynomial lookup. And uh, there are other circuits like foreign circuits if you have some kind of uh, foreign function that's pure, but it's uh, too complicated in semantic, but it's very performance critical for your circuit. You can implement your foreign instructions. And this is basically the uh, circuit architecture and it's all implemented in the whole ar arithmetic um, system. Okay, uh, so now um, there are one thing that makes uh, WebAssembly a little bit different because the linking is not kind of static every time it is. So, so once you put an image in that, you not only uh, have your code table that you have to reference on, you do not only have the initial memory table that you need to make sure that every time you read from uh, initialized memory, you get a correct thing. You also have some kind of uh, import table, which is the uh, import structures of the global variables, and you need to prove that the, the leaf uh, from uh, the, the 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 import leaf is somehow uh, point to the root of the import, so you can somehow access the correctness, a uh, correct um, global data. So uh, during the setup circuit, we fill in all these tables, and then the execution circuit is uh, it's also straightforward. It's it's about uh, 16 lines for one instruction because we will divide the uh, 64 bits uh, water into uh, 16 lines. And uh, uh, the last column is not the only column, so we, we, uh, any operators will, we have a few columns to somehow encoding the U64 um, uh, operators and the intermediate operators. So, and 
uh, yes, for the majority of the work is somehow encoding uh, the previous large instruction OP code table into this circuit. And uh, for this reader write, um, we somehow do a lookup for the course and we somehow fill in the core frame tables correctly and, and silly stuff. Okay, so uh, the, I start with the, the easiest one, which is numeric circuit. It's pretty easy. You somehow make sure that you um, pop the correct uh, argument from the stack and push the result back, right? And uh, during the circuit design, try to make sure that degree is not that too much, right? And uh, yeah, and basically like that, like that. So uh, we're using, so initially when we design this, we think that maybe, okay, so when we're using Plonk, then we're using the copy constraint to make sure that the copy constraint is somehow better than the stack machine, but it turns out it's not exactly because um, you, you push into the stack, it just costs one lookup, but if you're using the copy constraint, then okay, it's, it's kind of similar, I think. Um, and the core frame circuits, uh, it's, it's not very straightforward, but the basic idea is that if you, every time you call instruction, then you're calling um, that into the frame circuit, and every time you do a return, you get the correct uh, return address back. So it something like that. And uh, the instruction, the, 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 this is the core instruction. I'm going to skip that and skip that. So I've already, the return is it's nothing special. Every time we do a return, we lock uh, doing a polynomial lookup in from the uh, frame circuit and get the correct return address back. Okay, um, the branch is yet yeah, similar, um, nothing special. It does not change the core frame. And uh, the access log uh, circuit is uh, standard read write table, so every time you're sorting the access address and then uh, make sure that every time the read uh, instruction gets the uh, closest write instruction value from the access log circuit. Um, the foreign instructions uh, exist because if you have some kind of instruction that does not need the range check or does not do a lot of bitwise uh, stuff, then and if the um, the semantics of the kind of small blocks of instruction is simple enough. Uh, you can implement um, foreign circuits and foreign instructions and uh, inject that into the WebAssembly um, interpreter. Uh, for example, instead of uh, writing a state of art SHA-256, uh, right, we're just implementing this uh, customized, very simple foreign instructions and uh, inject that into the implementation of the SHA-256. It's not as quick as the state of art SHA-256, but it actually turns out not bad. Okay. And um, the limit of, oh, I will show the benchmark later, but the limit is that every time you run a, a significant amount of instruction that you somehow reach the, the total amount limit of the circuit so that you have to um, break the circuits, uh, break the instruction set into uh, sub-instruction sets, right? Um, but once you bring that, even you, you, if you can somehow aggregate a proof or batch in the proof, you still have to prove at least two things. The first thing is that the memory access table, or this is, so, okay, the, the instruction table somehow connect with each other, right? So uh, after you batch in the uh, proof, uh, in, in the aggregation uh, circuit, we also prove that uh, if this is somehow um, the split, then after this instruction, we're adding a pad, right? And in the subtrace two, we're adding another pad before that. So we can make sure that every time we're batching the proofs, um, the exclusion trace somehow connected. And also the same thing every time we would like to batch splitting the programs and batching them, we need to prove that the memory access table is somehow coherent. Uh, this is for the uh, memory consistent uh, during, the, during the batching. And uh, one might ask, well, what about the core frame table? Because the core frame table is that, not that big. Right? So every time we have a full core frame table for all the uh, sharding of the programs. So there's no need to prove the consistency of the core, core frames, because we have a full copy for every um, subproof. OK, so we were struggling a little bit because, uh, about whether we should show the benchmark. Uh, it's not perfect, but it has some kind of demonstration about 
uh, the end-to-end -end benchmark about uh, how many instructions that you can have uh, in, in the trace. So we, 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 we have two examples. One is a, a stack uh, intensive program. It's just a Fibonacci with lots of, with the depth, calling depth. And another is a benchmark for binary searching, but it has lots of memory use because uh, we um, have the search buffer to start from 26 times 64K. So it turns out, so if your program, I mean the web assembly bytecode program is not heavily using accessing the message, then you will somehow, um, in a small sharding of the program, you can achieve 100K instructions, okay? So, but, but if you have some kind of very memory intensive uh, by the cost of WebAssembly like search, then you will find that even the circuit size goes straight up to 222, um, and if your search buffer is very big, it's like 500 times 64K, then you still uh, have a instruction set less than um, a thousand. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, uh, here is our experimenting about the batching because uh, the batching circuit has to do two things. Uh, first is that they somehow encoding the verify functions into the, the, the verify functions into into the circuit, uh, which needs a uh, ECC circuits. Um, we have to simulate FP or FRB. And the other stuff that we have to do is that we have to make sure that all the subproofs have coherent uh, memory accessing and instruction uh, execution trace. And uh, this is the benchmark for the aggregating, and it seems that our best strategy is that we always using the partition CS to be two to the 22, and which may takes um, about a few minutes to do the, do the batching, okay. And yeah, uh, so if, if I still have time there, okay, yeah, that's it, basically what I have. Questions? Uh, hi, thank you for this great talk. So uh, I have a question. So like, as I understand, you you have used like WASM interpreter to interpret WASM. Yes, and um, like, does it make sense to use, for example, I know kind of AOT compilation, kind of WASM or WASM time, yeah. like use it to execute WebAssembly and then like, I know like store somewhere a trace of WebAssembly, executed WebAssembly instructions. And then, like, make a proof for these instructions. Yeah. So, I mean, like, uh, yeah, I, I understand that, like, creation, proof creation dominates in, like, over all time. Yeah. But maybe we can just, like, in, uh, decrease time of WebAssembly execution itself. Uh, yes. So, so I have an experiment. Oh, sorry. It, I, it cannot come back. Um, I mean, so there are some toxic circuits in, in, in when designing that. So, for example, we have all this kind of ready check, right? So for example, you have this kind of bounded variables for i equal to zero from, from, from zero to 10, right? Every time you, you pop an i into the stack and get this i back, you do not have to do the actually the, the ready check, right? So the idea is that if you, we can somehow spot, if, uh, spot this kind of stuff and make several arrangements that do not need ready check into a, a foreign instruction that this can actually increase the um, benchmark, but I think this is not our currently our focus. So we were trying to push the yeah the the the, the, the usability and the, the instruction set first, and then after that we will probably do the um, basic block oriented um, optimization after this. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. You, uh, any other questions? So th thank you again, and thanks all the speaker of the session. Okay, thanks. So I don't know what our marching orders now, but uh, the session is concluded. Thank you.